And we're going in. There she is. My first and last time ever on a ship. I'm happy to say this one is docked, not going anywhere, so I should be able to survive. <laughs> Anne's gone off in front. The excitement has hit her. She doesn't even know I'm back here. There's a sign. Queen Mary, a home for the night. Let's see how many ghosts we can catch. Okay, we are going to find our stateroom. And of course, it's all the way down the hall. Tiny, teeny weeny beds. That's good. It's okay, we're in. We've um, got a bed each. And it's a there's portholes. There's portholes. Oh there. my god. Oh. What have I done? <laughs> what the f I think that was the ship, was it? Was it the ship that did that? Throughout our time together, we're going to gradually make our way down three decks. Every time we stop moving, I'm going to tell you a ghost story. I want to be clear, these are not my ghost stories, because I don't have any ghost stories, but they are the stories that were told to us by passengers and crew. Whether or not you believe in the paranormal, I'm going to give you just enough history so the stories at least make sense in reference to the ship. Here are the basics. <clears throat> Queen Mary was owned and operated by the Cunard Line. She made her maiden voyage May 27th, 1936. Her route was between Southampton, England, and New York City. At the time, she was the largest and fastest ship ever built. Over 81,000 gross tons, capable speeds up to 34 knots, about 37 miles per hour. In the outbreak of the Second World War, the Queen Mary was drafted into service as a troop transport. She would bring soldiers from the United States to Great Britain, wounded soldiers and prisoners of war from Great Britain back to the United States on one occasion, carrying over 16,000 people in one crossing. The role the war became so important that Hitler offered a quarter of a million dollar bounty to any of his German U-boat captains that could sink her. After the war, she continued passenger service for another 20 years before being retired in 1967. The Queen Mary was put up for auction. The city of Long Beach was the highest bidder at just under three and a half million dollars. December 9th will be the 56th anniversary of her arrival in Long Beach. Throughout the Queen Mary's history, there have been 58 confirmed deaths on board. The reason I say confirmed is because anytime there's a war involved, a lot of information always ends up classified. But we do have records of people passing away from illness, old age, accidents. Sometimes our guests or crew believe they have seen the deceased walking the decks of our ship. Our first ghost story, is about the Mauritania room. When the Queen Mary was in service, this was the tourist class main lounge, also known as the garden lounge or the wicker lounge because of all the wicker furniture that used to be in here. Since the ship came to Long Beach, it's now held over for smaller private events. In 1989, there's some housekeepers who came in to set up for one such event. They came across a lady in a lovely evening gown that they described as old fashioned, sitting in a wicker chair in the middle of the dance floor. She wasn't hurting anything, they went about their business. But a few moments later, their boss, the head housekeeper, walked in and asked about the lady in the evening gown. They told her, 
We don't know what she wants. The head housekeeper went to find out. She addressed the woman several times, but she didn't speak, she didn't move. Finally, the housekeeper threatened to call security. While she was on the phone, the lady in the evening gown stood up. She looked around the room, even smiled. And then both the lady and the wicker chair disappeared. All three women claimed to have seen the same thing. This apparition lasted for almost 10 minutes, which is the longest we have on record. But folks, as we're moving, we're not a big group. We try to stay close together. Now we need to be wandering off and becoming one of our ghost stories. We have one years at sea. She catered to thousands of passengers. Some were more prolific than others. One of the most prolific passengers to sail the Queen Mary was Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Great Britain during World War II. He sailed the ship <clears throat> six times, four times during the war, two times afterwards with his wife. Whenever he was on board during World War II, he had his own private suite, and the rooms around that became his war offices. We now have a designated Churchill suite. M 119 on the starboard side is believed to be the room he stayed in. It is also the most requested hotel room on board. A lot of the guests who stay in there tell us at random times they will smell cigar smoke. Now, if you don't know anything about Winston Churchill, he was notorious for being a very heavy drinker and smoker. Parapsychologists believe that the smell of cigar smoke is Churchill's essence, lingering in the room even three quarters of a century after he occupied it. That led to a story of a housekeeper following the smell of cigar smoke right up to the door of the Churchill suite. She knocked several times, no answer. Finally, just keyed herself in. She said she came across a portly gentleman sitting in a chair smoking a cigar. When she informed him, sir, there is no smoke allowed on the ship. He dissolved into a portrait above the chair, which just so happens to be of Winston Churchill. I told that story about a decade ago. I had a very nice Englishman walk up to me and say, I don't believe that for a second. His issue with the story was that if it was really the ghost of Sir Winston, before dissolving, he would have said something snarky or sexist first. <laughs> now we're coming down the stairs. As you can probably guess, we are standing in the hotel lobby. The front desk used to be the purser's desk. The purser, kind of like the concierge of the hotel, who's in charge of the maids, the stewards, organizing social activities on board. The port side shop was the bank, the small <coughs> lounge was the doctor's office. Both sides could be used for the first class passengers to board the ship, and here on the starboard side, we replaced the steel hatches with windows, so you have a fantastic view of downtown Long Beach. If you happen to be a fan of Dexter or CSI Miami, downtown Miami. There was a mother and daughter exploring the ship late one night. They decided to take a break here in the starboard lounge. They were sitting in the chairs chatting. Nobody else was around. They claimed. They could hear a soft melody coming from this original piano. They were not the first or last people to make that claim. A lot of our hotel guests were on a late night expedition trying to find an ice machine who would wander by until they saw the bench shift on its own and then they would also hear a soft melody. But we don't know who the ghost pianist is, but the music is thought to accompany a ghost that we call the Lady in White. Now some believe she was a war bride. Right after World War II ended, Queen Mary became the bride and baby shuttle. She brought all of the American GI's sweethearts and the children they conceived overseas from the United Kingdom to the United States. The catch was, the only way these ladies got off the ship and stayed in the States was if their soldier came to claim them. As we believe the Lady in White was a war bride who was never claimed. No one I've ever talked about seems to think that she died on board. So parapsychologists believe the devastation of being left behind trapped her spirit here. Whatever the reason, wherever this piano goes, it's had a few different homes throughout the ship, people tell us that they see the Lady in White in a long white gown dancing alone as if she's waiting for a new partner. Folks, if you'd like to quit, to the haunted. <laughs> oh, no. <clears throat> when I first started working here, a couple of housekeepers told me that this lady's room was haunted by a ship's officer. In this man's defense, when Queen Mary was in service, these restrooms were the other way around. As far as the officer is concerned, ladies, you just walked into the men's room. But who is the ship's officer? Well, some believe that this was an incident in 1949. Second officer William Stark was invited to the staff captain's quarters along with a few other officers of the watch for a pre-dinner drink. Stark just happened to get there first and he asked the steward for some gin. After some searching, the steward presented Stark with a bottle he found in a footlocker. Stark poured himself a drink, shot it back, and realized immediately it wasn't gin. 
The other officers arrived. He just kind of laughed off saying, I do believe I've just poisoned myself. He had. That gin bottle contained carbon tetrachloride, an industrial cleaning solution. He died three days later. There's the housekeepers who think he's haunting the ladies' room, but he is far more often reported being seen up in the officers' quarters or simply roaming the decks of the ship. Moving forward. <laughs> Not its original location, but this is the Beamery Fire Station, even the old CO2 canisters. Fire was a very real concern on the ship of beautiful woods. This is also not where it belongs. It should be at the bottom of the ship. There were a lot of safety lessons taken from the Titanic when the Queen Mary was built. First and foremost, they extended the bulkheads or walls all the way to the ceiling. They also increased the number of watertight hatches. In the Queen Mary's case, she had 38 hydraulic hatches. So in the event of a hull breach or a fire, these hatches, which were remotely controlled from the wheelhouse, would slam shut with 700 pounds of hydraulic pressure in less than a minute. An alarm would sound to let the engineers know they're going to close. It'd take about 35 seconds for the pressure to build, and then depending on the size of the hatch, it'd slide closed in 6 to 12 seconds. Working in the machine areas could get monotonous. If it was smooth sailing, meaning no real issues to tend to, the engineers pretty much just stood around waiting for their ship to end. So during fire drills, they invented a game called chicken. Once they heard the alarm, they would start jumping from one side to the other to see how many times they could make it through before the hatch slammed shut. 1966, on a very foggy day in July, just as a precaution, the captain ordered all the hatches closed. Up in the wheelhouse, they watched all the little indicator lights come on, except for one. The engineers made their way down into the aft engine room and discovered an 18-year-old fireman crushed in hatch 13. They got him out, they took him to the infirmary. He was pronounced dead shortly thereafter. And now get reports, people will see a young man in coveralls who simply fades from view. A few reports of disembodied whistling, and women will complain they felt somebody pull their hair. As a theory why the engineer will specifically target women. In the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, probably even in the 70s, women were not allowed in machine areas on the ship. You did not go into the engine room. You definitely didn't go in the boiler rooms. So the engineer could be pulling your hair and say, hey, we don't belong here. Nobody knows for sure how he got caught in the hatch, because he was down there by himself. There are those who insist he was playing chicken. But there are others who think he was just coming back for a tool that he had dropped, and he misjudged the timing of the door. Because we also get reports of people hearing him whisper, have you seen my wrench? The folks who go out to take a photo of the hatch, go out pose with the hatch, go right ahead, and go back inside to the stairs. Room B340, which is supposed to be the most haunted room on the ship. We'll pass it in just a moment. It is the very first room on the port side of B deck. It is not marked in any way. As soon as the ghost shows made B340 famous, people started breaking into it and stealing things. The favorite thing to steal was the nameplates that said B340, so we stopped replacing them. The first ghost story about that room came from the 1960s. A passenger woke up in the middle of the night and claimed she felt someone repeatedly pulling the sheets off of her. At first she thought the sheets had just fallen off, so she pulled them back up. They got pulled back down. She pulled them back up. They got pulled back down. A full-on tug of war ensued. Before she remembered, she was in the room by herself. She looked up, saw the silhouette of a man standing at the foot of her bed. She screamed. The man disappeared. Her scream got the full attention of the night steward who ran up the hall into her room. Once she calmed down enough to explain what had happened, the steward explained that when he passed her room, he didn't see anybody go in, <coughs> and he passed anybody in the hall on his way back. You jump forward to the 1980s. The whole space was a standard hotel room. A housekeeper went in to change the linens. She stepped out to get some towels for the bathroom. When she went back in, she found the sheets on the bed that she had just made in a pile in the middle of the floor. All the activity in B340 is attributed to a death reported in 1950. The staff captain was making his rounds after everyone had disembarked, and he discovered the passenger had passed away in his bed. Cause of death? Unknown. Whoever this gentleman was, we just call him Walter. He's the ghost that's believed to haunt B340. The room is discontinued for renting because of the constant complaints from hotel guests. They wake up to see the lights in the bathroom turning on and off by themselves. Guests would leave the room, come back, and all the water fixtures would be running, or they would hear a knock at the door, open it, and of course, there's nobody there. So finally, the hotel said, enough, and they shut it down. 
I was taught for years afterwards of restoring being three forty, renting it, renting it out <clears throat> as the haunted room. So in 2018, it became a mini suite that went for about a thousand dollars a night. Our first non-promotional guests That's kept calling me. the front desk to say, "Okay, we get it. Get your special effects now. We just want to go to sleep." The attendant had to keep telling these people, there are no special effects, we just remodeled the room. They left abruptly at two o'clock in the morning. I'm guessing they had a good time. <laughs> right this way. Is this where Disney took over the ship and uh, picked up one of the rooms? Yeah. That's the question. <laughs> 